Okay, good evening to everyone. We'll, um, we'll say the prayer and we can start for today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. We have glory to thee, our God, glory to thee, O heavenly King, comfort the spirit of truth, who is everywhere, present and fill us all things, treasure of blessings in your of life, come and abide in us, and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, a good one. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Good evening, everyone, once again. Uh, Father Matthew, thank you once again for being with us. Uh, I hope we can uh, do this uh, more and more often. Uh, we will, God willing, uh, take a small break between... Uh, after the end of the Apostolic Lent. So after July 12th, we'll take a small break of a few weeks, but we will continue shortly afterwards at the beginning of August. Uh, however, until then, we'll have the regular catechism from two o'clock and of course, the liturgy of uh, the uh, Bible studies every Wednesday. Father, I'm gonna make you a okay. uh, host. Let me just make host. Here you go. Okay, fabulous. Thank you, Father. And thank you, everyone. Uh, really great to see you all. And for those of you that I saw this past week, it was a real pleasure. Uh, hopefully that will be the, the uh, first among many others in the future. Um, okay, so tonight, my friends, we are going to kind of backtrack chronologically from the authors that we have been studying recently uh, to kind of go back primarily to look at the scriptures. And, um, and in particular, uh, about two sacraments of the, of the ancient church, which of course are uh, foundational to the church to our, in our day as well. And, um, and I just kind of want to sort of put it in a little bit of historical um, context and to say that after the resurrection, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Lord, um, the, and then the Ascension, which we just celebrated somewhat recently, and after Pentecost, uh, the direction of the church in Jerusalem fell to the Apostle James, um, who in our Greek sources is oftentimes referred to as Iakovos o Dikaios, uh, uh, which means James the Righteous or James the Just, as it's variously translated. Um, he is known as it, 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 both in the, the church and in the scriptures um, as James, the brother of the Lord. Now, I know Father Borian just mentioned a moment ago that we'll be talking more about what that means um, later on, maybe next week. But I'll just sort of preemptively say that uh, what this most certainly does not mean is that, he, that James was certainly mo most certainly not the full brother of Christ. Uh, because the church from the very beginning of apostolic times has always taught the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of the Virgin Mary. That is, she was always a virgin, is always a virgin. And uh, so what do we mean when we say that even the scriptures themselves in the, the epistle uh, to the Galatians, St. Paul refers to uh, St. James as the brother of the Lord. Um, and the, the response to that, the answer to that is the fact is that um, James was the stepbrother of Christ. Uh, that is, he was the child of Joseph from a previous marriage. Joseph was much, much older than the Virgin Mary when they were betrothed. His whole, and th this is sort of intimated in the Gospels by the fact that we hear nothing about uh, Saint Joseph after the childhood of Christ. And so um, he, he probably died uh, at some point relatively early on in our Lord's earthly life. Um, there are uh, Saint Jerome writing at the end of the fourth century believed that James might have been a, uh, a cousin of Christ. The term brother uh, could potentially st be used in the, uh, in, in the scriptures for somebody who was a cousin, but um, we can, we'll talk more about this next week. There are other people that are named actually in the New Testament as being brothers of, of Christ. And these were, these would be the children of the apostle, I'm sorry, of the, of St. Joseph from a pre previous marriage. Um, so there, it would be technically a stepbrother. Okay. The point though, uh, to make in all this is that James assumed leadership in the Jerusalem church. Um, now, this Jerusalem church, the earliest church, had a decisively Old Testament or Jewish character. All of its members, indeed, essentially were Jews, and it would have included, of course, the Virgin Mary and some of the other uh, kinsmen and female disciples of the Lord. 
the apostles Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James, as well as uh, Matthias, who was um, uh, chosen to be, uh, to take the place of Judas Iscariot after, of course, he had uh, committed suicide. Um, incidentally, this is a place that is, uh, um, uh, that is, uh, still can be seen uh, if one wants to uh, in, in the Holy Land. It is known as, it is called Akel Dama, the field of blood. And uh, it is, there's actually an Armenian monastery you can see in this picture uh, up on the, on the cliff there. Um, if anyone, one of you ever wondered what the deal was, why is it that the Gospels in Matthew 27, for instance, says that Judas hung himself and why? Do, and then on the other hand, it says in Acts 1, 18 through 19, how is it that it says that Judas fell headlong and, and burst asunder? Um, uh, how is it that those two things can be reconciled? It has always been the tradition of the ancient church. And as I said, if you go to the place called Akaldama to this day, um, you will see that there is a big cliff there, as you see in front of you. So in other words, he hung himself over the side of a cliff on a, on a, on a tree branch, uh, which then snapped and he fell headlong and burst asunder when he fell. So th that's, that's the patristic and, and, and ancient church tradition as to how those two things are reconciled to one another. Um, now, as I said, the early Jerusalem church had a very much an Old Testament kind of um, uh, Jewish character to it. These members, these early, the earliest apostles would have still maintained uh, their devout Jewish ways, uh, following the Mosaic law, following Jewish dietary traditions, and continuing to worship in the temple at Jerusalem. Um, and therefore, in many outward respects, would seem to be still Jews, although it uh, although the, it is important to note that there was obviously a very, very profound difference uh, in addition to their, their continuing to worship in the temple, they also would worship in private houses. And it was there uh, that they would perform the Lord's Supper. And that is really where I want to begin, actually, um, with, our, uh, uh, with our discussion uh, today because the the two the two sacraments that really mark the new covenant as uh, as we read about for instance and as the earliest apostles understood in jeremiah 31 31 where god specifically says i will make a new covenant that is the new testament with the house of israel this new covenant um is marked by the by the sacraments in the church this is these are things that the old testament did not have Okay, the Old Testament worship in many ways was foreshadowing of the New Testament worship, particularly with the animal sacrifices and the washings. Okay, these are two things that uh, find their fulfillment. They were types, essentially, in the, of the old, in the Old Testament. They were types of two of the most central sacraments in the New Testament, namely the baptism and the Eucharist. Um, and it is, it is to those two sacraments that I really want to, to examine in, in kind of some detail right now. But the point to understand is that in the Old Testament, these, these, um, these types, these typologies of the New Testament sacraments already existed. Um, however, they really couldn't achieve anything, okay? Uh, the, uh, the washings of the, uh, of the Old Testament, you know, the purification rituals and so on, um, uh, they really didn't wash away anything in terms of besides physical impurities. They were kind of just symbolic, pointing to the coming of baptism, which can effectually uh, wash away sins. Likewise, the sacrifices in the temple um, ultimately didn't really do anything. They were and they they were necessary insofar as they were given to man by God to, for man to show his de devotion to God and to give something to God. And this is something that actually you can see throughout the entire ancient world, even to, the, even to a degree uh, to the, in parts of the world now where paganism is still practiced, um, that every culture essentially has some idea about sacrifice, that sacrifice is indeed kind of like the mark of religion in, uh, in throughout all pre-Christian religions, that the idea of you need to take something that is alive and give it to a deity uh, so as to expiate one's sins. This is a common feature um, of throughout all ancient religions. And 
Uh, you know, you can look at the ancient Greeks and, and uh, even, you know, Amazonian witch doctors, and they have similar kind of concepts in mind. Of course, it's very perverted and very strange and and uh, indeed, they're not really, those cultures are not really offering it to God, they were offering it to unclean spirits kind of pretending to be gods. But the point really is that there is somehow built into the hard drive of humanity, some notion of the fact that there is sin, and that there is a moral order that gets violated when we sin and that we somehow need to correct that, we somehow need to fix that. Uh, but as I said, even in the Old Testament sacrifices, which, which were ordained by God himself, the true God, and uh, they nevertheless didn't really achieve anything. They didn't really affect anything. In fact, you can even see this with the word for um, atonement, which is used in the Old Testament. Um, of course, you are probably all familiar with the word Yom Kippur, Okay, that is a phrase which means the day of atonement um, and Jews to this day will still go to a temple on Yom Kippur and will fast and will pray and it is meant to be a day Yom means day and Kippur means atonement it is translated as that but what it really means actually Kippur means uh, covering and you can hear the word uh, for covering in the similarity with that which that word Kippur has with the word kippah, which is actually another name for a yarmulke. Uh, it is a covering upon one's head. And so what those sacrifices did in the Old Testament, they did not really achieve atonement. They, 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 they did not wash away sins. What they did was they kind of covered one's sins, okay? And that is a very big difference. Okay, that is a very big difference. And uh, if, in, it's a fascinating and beautiful etymology. The word atonement, as I'm sure many of you might already know, actually, is if you just change the syllable, uh, change the stress of the syllable, instead of atonement to at one mint, that is actually what the word atonement means. It is really the phrase at one mint. Um, ad unamentum is the Latin phrase for that. Uh, so it is becoming at one with God, okay? That is what atonement actually means, to become at one with him. And the, th those that uh, at one mint with God uh, can only be achieved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, um, and so it is, it is to this, the New Testament sacraments of baptism and Eucharist that I would now like to turn. Um, in particular, uh, there has been, uh, since the 1600s, uh, actually even really, even really slightly earlier than that, um, an idea that has percolated throughout much of the Protestant world of what is known as believer's baptism. Uh, the idea being that um, infants or those who are somehow not rationally um, capable because of their the tenderness of their age, they should not receive baptism, that they should only receive baptism at an age in which um, they are uh, intellectually capable of understanding what they're doing. That age varies among different uh, groups. Uh, so some might put it at, I don't know, 10 or something like that. Some might put it at a, a teenage years. Some might put it later. Um, because it is, it is kind of a very, uh, this, this idea, as we're going to see, is, is totally not with basis inside of the New Testament. So it was sort of left left to the Protestant reformers and subs to kind of figure out for themselves at what age this would be appropriate. Um, uh, if anyone is interested in, in delving into all the patristic sources about this, uh, the book that I have on the screen in front of you, Infant Baptism in the First Four Centuries by uh, Joachim Jer Jeremias, he was a German, um, uh, but it is translated into English, which came out in 1960. This book goes over all of the patristic sources, literally every, he just combed them all, and it's a wonderful scatter of information, but, uh, but put into a very, very concise and readable form. And uh, he comes to the conclusion, which should be no surprise to, uh, to those of us inside of the Orthodox Church, that uh, infant baptism was the standard practice uh, to a large degree. It was certainly, it certainly was practiced, I'll, I'll put it that way. Whether or not it was standard, uh, that's, th that word itself would need definition, but um, it was certainly practiced throughout the first four centuries, including in apostolic times, okay? Um, 
and I would like to kind of walk you through that and the theology of that right now, because it is in some ways kind of the major sticking point for a lot of people who, when looking at the um, Orthodox Church coming from evangel uh, evangelical Christianity or coming from one of the various Baptist denominations, um, they are all of those Baptist denominations are united by this one idea <clears throat> that you don't baptize infants. The whole Anabaptist movement essentially uh, formed itself uh, primarily around this idea, of course, with the other, uh, you know, the, the solas from uh, from Luther. But um, OK, now I'm going to ground as much of what I can say uh, as I can in Scripture. There are some preliminary texts that are important for understanding infant baptism. Uh, so we can just read some of those very briefly right now. Um, in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, we read that the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Okay. Uh, at heart or at issue with the, um, with the um, topic of infant baptism is the question of can another person that it would be a godparent stand in place as a sponsor for an un uh, for a child who does not have yet possession of his or her rational faculties, and um, this text in First Corinthians seven fourteen would seem to indicate that yes, indeed, that children somehow uh, can be sanctified as by through the actions of their parents. We of course can see other uh, incidences of this. Uh, inside of the New Testament. Uh, I just was having a discussion with George today um, when we talked about that passage. I believe it is in from the Gospel of uh, Mark, but I could be wrong about that, where uh, the man is brought by his four friends to Christ, who is inside of a little house, and they cannot get in to him uh, for, for Christ to heal their friend who's on his bed uh, because of the press of people. And so they remove the roof of the house and lower the man down uh, on his bed. And it says very clearly in the gospel, then you could take a look. It says, and Christ seeing their faith said to the man, Your fa uh, go in peace, uh, pick up your bed and, and walk. Um, and uh, in other words, he sees the faith, not just of the man, but of their faith. It's almost as if their faith is kind of what is being in the uh, sort of the um, conditional cause of, of Christ healing them. Okay, <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll leave that there. And if we look at the second of these texts, Acts 21, 21, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after their customs, uh, after, the, after the customs. So we're going to deal a lot with uh, infant circumcision momentarily because it is absolutely the uh, typology of uh, New Testament baptism. And lastly, Mark 10, 13 through 16, and they brought young children to him, that would be to the Lord, that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, and put his hands upon them, and bless them. Uh, I don't want to spoil too much of everything I'm about to say, but uh, I'll just, maybe I'll just, I will <laughs> basically say that uh, the idea that children are sort of imperfect Christians that uh, need to sort of be, you know, come to a higher level before they can fully embrace Christ uh, is, is totally at variance with what the Lord himself says in this passage, and which, and also just the general uh, our whole understanding of, uh, of, of, of Christianity, uh, when, you know, the Lord says, um, uh, whosoever shall not uh, receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Children are so far from being imperfect Christians that cannot partake fully in the life of the church. They are indeed the model 
for us adults, okay? They are the model for, for us older people. It is quite the opposite, that we are the model for them in that regard. Yes, of course, we have to teach them and we have to discipline them and so on. But nevertheless, that childlike simplicity, that, that um, refusal of the Lord to, to um, forbid children to come unto him, uh, that applies to baptism as well. Um, okay, <clears throat> now, let me try to articulate as best I can um, the theology behind why we believe in inf infant baptism. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm going to put forward the thesis that the baptism of infants is both a biblical practice and one that has a great measure of unanimity in church history and tradition. Beginning with Abraham. Abraham, of course, is our forefather in the faith, uh, who lived 2,000 years before the incarnation of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God appeared to Abraham while he was living in Ur of the Chalcedons, which of course would be Babylonia, and God told Abraham to set out on a journey, at which point God entered into a covenant with Abraham by promising to be his God and the God of his descendants, who in turn would be his chosen people. This is, of course, in Genesis 12 to 17, everything I've just said. Now, the sign and the seal of God's relationship with Abraham was circumcision. It served to show that those who possessed circumcision belonged to God. And we read it here in uh, Genesis. Uh, my own Genesis 17. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the circumcised man, and the and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Okay, so there we have uh, a clear and precise explication that the covenant applied not just to those who were old enough intellectually to accept it, but also to children. Um, now, Saint Paul posits that in the church, circumcision has been done away with as the sign of the covenant, as we read in Galatians 6.15, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. While God no longer employs circumcision as before, he continues to be the God of the covenant. He has not changed the way in which he deals with his people, even though the covenant with Abraham has come to fulfillment in the new covenant, uh, which we, we can read about in Galatians 3 through 4. God, that is, and this is really the, at the heart of sacramental theology, God still uses physical means to establish his covenantal relationship with his people and to communicate his grace, okay? And, to, and this sign distinguishes his people from the world. This new sign marks them as his own. And what is that sign? Well, in the church, Christian baptism is the new covenant sign which conveys God's grace to his people. Baptism has replaced circumcision. This is very clearly taught by St. Paul in Col Colossians 2, 11 through 12, in whom also, that is, in him we might circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, okay? So, in other words, St. Paul is saying that Christian believers have in baptism the fulfillment of circumcision. What circumcision was to Abraham and his descendants until the coming of, of the Christ in the flesh, baptism now is for Christians. It is the mark of God's ownership uh, uh, and of our salvation. This is also can be seen in Romans 4.11. And Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, 
that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Now, in reflecting on the moment when God instituted the covenant of circumcision with Abraham, we see that God not only established the sign of circumcision, but God told Abraham very clearly who should receive this Old Testament sacrament, if I can be so bold as to use that phrase. Uh, Moses himself writes, quote, and uh, if we just read that passage again. He that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. Okay. And um, now, uh, and of course, he goes on to, uh, it explains very clearly that this is to be done on the eighth day of, uh, of life. And therefore, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm admitting people as I'm talking. Um, and so being on the eighth day of life, uh, infant, circumc infant circumcision was therefore mandated by God. Okay, so... Because infant circumcision is the biblical precedent for infant baptism, circumcision, as we read, was given to the infants of one or more believing parents, and the same is true for baptism today, as has always been the case in church history. Indeed, as St. Peter said on the day of Pentecost itself, which we just celebrated this past Sunday in the Orthodox Church, when he spoke about the forgiveness that God promises in baptism, he said this, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. So, therefore, any criticism to um, lodge against infant baptism could equally be applied to infant circumcision, which uh, would be a blasphemous criticism of God's ancient institutions. Okay. There's that. Now, the second major thread of biblical teaching, which also shows and makes plain the divine character of infant baptism, is what is oftentimes referred to as the oikos formula. Uh, the word oikos is simply the ancient Greek word for house. It can mean both the building of a house or the uh, household, that is the people, the family living in it in almost every instance that I'm going to be referring to right now, it means the latter, uh, the people. And the New Testament uses this so-called oikos formula um, again and again, and it allows us to answer the question, was baptism administered in the New Testament according to the Abrahamic model uh, of the whole household, as we just read in Genesis, or according to the modern Baptist model, which insists that baptism is an individual and adult decision. Okay. And the answer to that is, of course, uh, it, there, there really is no debate. All throughout the entire New Testament, you see the oikos formula. That is, that when one person accepts Christianity, the whole household, or the whole family accepts Christianity, which presumably would include also little children as well if they were around. Um, and on the, con on the other hand, there is never one instance inside of all of the New Testament where we read about a young person who was raised in a Christian family, who attends churches, who prays to Christ, who accepts, and only when he is of a sufficiently mature age then is baptized. There never is one example of that, okay? That is a totally invented idea. Uh, that um, that one never sees in Scripture. Let's take a look at some of these examples. Repeatedly, as I said, throughout the New Testament, we come across incidents in which whole households were saved and baptized. So common, indeed, is it that, that this happens, that there, there is a clearly repeated formula about the whole house being saved or baptized. And that is what I mean, incidentally. I guess I didn't define that earlier. That is what I mean by the oikos formula. And here are some examples. And Jesus, Luke 19, 1 through 10, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. 
And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was, and he could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man, by false accusation I restore him fourfold. And now this is the crucial part. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, that is the oikos, the household, the family, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is found also in this, uh, not just in Zacchaeus, um, but also consider St. Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 1.16. I did baptize the household of Stephanus, okay? That is not just Stephanus, but all of his family members as well. And again, concerning Lydia and her family. And when she and her husband, I'm sorry, when she and her household, her oikos, had been baptized, and I'll just cut that off there, but the point is obvious. And again, concerning the Philippian jailer and his family, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And again, the Lord, uh, uh, in First Timothy 1.16, the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesephorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Onesephorus, we recall, had served Paul, so the apostle is invoking here a blessing upon his whole household. Again, the same idea that I've kind of been articulating this whole time, that because of the faith and actions of one man, or even a couple of people, God will bless uh, and, and give grace to those related to them, okay, those who are part of their household, okay. Um, and there are numerous texts throughout the New Testament which relate to the salvation of whole households at, a, at the same time. The salvation of the household is indeed the usual New Testament pattern, not the salvation of independent individuals. And if you want, I could just give you, I don't, do I put them in? Yes, here, look at some other passages just to totally um, do overkill. John 4, 53. So the father knew that it was uh, at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth and himself believed and his whole house, you see. Uh, Acts 2, 10. Cornelius, a devout man, that means a pagan who, uh, who for somehow was exposed to Jewish monotheism and came to believe believe in the true God. This is a specific word that uses a theophobes, a God fearer. Uh, Cornelius, a devout man and one who feared God, there it is, with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. I see that phrase, though. He feared God with his whole household, you see. Um, and Hebrews 11, 7 through 9, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet not seen as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, uh, his oikos, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. And Matthew 10, 12 through 14, and when ye come into an house, salute it, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. Okay, so there's just... Uh, passage after passage after passage and this household formula of baptism is conspicuously present indeed in the data of the new testament and uh, that it leads to the undeniable conclusion that the general practice was the baptism of an entire household at one time um which whenever it, it, whenever that included little children, children, infants, or whatever under the, you know, young, young children, they would have also been baptized. There's no idea of them not being baptized. And it is so much so that the, um, the baptism of individuals one by one, as is practiced and emphasized by the Baptist movement, we can say decisively was not the practice of the first Christians. Okay. Um, and just to continue on with this analysis, these references to receiving the covenantal sign of baptism are, as we see, couched in the exact same language as the references to Abraham's reception of the covenantal sign of circumcision. 
The Old Testament pattern of giving God's salvation and the addition to the whole household, including to infants. And of course, uh, we have to remember uh, Isaac, right? Isaac is a child uh, who would have received circumcision. Um, this carries right on over into the New Testament. As a matter of fact, uh, there is, as I said before, but I'll repeat it again, there is not a single reference in the New Testament to any person being baptized who had been raised in a Christian home and had finally become an adult and able to exercise reason to believe and be baptized. It simply didn't happen like that. Infants were baptized together with the whole household, and those infants who were born into a Christian family were given the grace of baptism as infants after the pattern of Abraham. The testimony of church history is of no small importance in this matter of infant baptism because it demonstrates that believers and their children were baptized uh, uh, just in, in accordance with the New Testament oikos formula. Um, and this has been affirmed by the Orthodox Church, uh, also by the Catholics, and, and uh, um, even, even indeed, actually, uh, the original reformers like Luther. Um, infant baptism has remained uh, the standard practice for the vast majority uh, of, of, co of course, for orthodoxy, but even for the vast majority of Protestant uh, communions as well, including the Church of England, Presbyterianism, uh, the Methodists, the Wesleyans, and the Lutherans. Okay, so um, it, is, uh, it is a distinct problem among the, the Anabaptist-derived faiths, um, but it, it, it is not really a problem for even uh, a lot of other Protestants. And we might say, what is the connection here? Why is it that, especially because in America, so much of Protestantism is based, uh, does derive from these Anabaptist movements? Why is it that um, that, that happened? Um, I can only give my own personal reflections upon this and say that uh, I think it has a lot to do with the individual, um, the, the, the kind of um, tradition of rugged individualism that America is so heavily steeped in. Um, we in America, uh, obviously, we have a great uh, tradition. We're all taught from the time we're little kids. You know, you could become anything you want. You can, you, you know, be anything you want. You know, and nothing can hold you back. Uh, there is, we are a far cry from the old, more traditional days of the European societies that were, you know, where one child would follow in the footsteps of his father and become, you know, the thing that his father was, whether that be a, uh, a cobbler or a craftsman or a blacksmith or something like that. Um, uh, we are certainly very far removed from the time in, in late antiquity and throughout the early Middle Ages, when many um, kingdoms and tribes of people throughout Europe adopted Christianity en masse, okay? Uh, the, uh, it, it, what, what I think is being failed to grasp in the Anabaptist um, position on infant baptism is the, is the fact that throughout Christian history, it was extremely common. In fact, it was the standard thing for entire kingdoms to, em to embrace Christianity at once when their leader converted, okay? Um, uh, the, the Slavs, obviously in 988, we know about, uh, every, I'm sure many, most of you are familiar with Prince Vladimir, who was baptized, and you know this is the so-called baptism of Rus that took place at this moment. But it happened many times too among uh, the Franks and you know other Germanic tribes who are, you know, uh, you know, living in early medieval Europe. Um, when their leaders would become Christian, then the entire society would become Christian. Now, no doubt there 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 might not have been. Uh, tremendous understanding of the subtleties of, of Christian theology by a lot of those converts. Um, but that is true among most Christians to this day, I should say. Uh, I would say majority of Christians have, don't have very little understanding of the intricacies of, of theology. Um, they, but it was the standard thing. We are not disconnected one from another. The myth of individualism is so deeply ingrained within American society um, that we, we rarely stop to even question it. But it is really a product of the modern age in many ways. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that alienation and the, de the atomization of individuals from their roots, from their culture, from their uh, race, from, from you name it, um, is an, it is the defining feature of the modern age, okay? The idea that we are all just sort of like adrift and we form our own 
identities based on our own predilections, our own elective affinities. You know that uh, you know we're kind of a blank slate, and so therefore we choose identities for ourselves. You know, at a, at an earlier time, when a person might choose to become a you know, a socialist, or they might choose to become a vegetarian animal rights activist, and this kind of becomes the defining feature of their lives. Or nowadays, of course, as we all know, it's it's gone to such a pitch of insanity that people actually feel that they can choose their own gender. You know, but but that is not the way reality works. Um, we we are defined to a large degree by the things that we cannot change about ourselves. Okay our ethnicities, our race, our language that we were brought up, brought up speaking, certainly our gender. And uh, to, to, uh, to a large extent, that is because we are not, we are not really individuals. Um, the individual doesn't really exist in nature, you see. Uh, you know, if, if you leave, if a, if a mother gives birth to a child and then just leaves the way that... <clears throat> Uh, I don't know, the way that it happens in, say, the animal kingdom for, you know, like, a, I don't know, a sloth or something like that, it, you know, if they give birth to their child and just let it go, um, often that child will die, okay? Uh, the, the, there is nothing more help, helpless in the, uh, in, the, in the world than a human infant, okay? Everything has to be done for that, that infant. Uh, everything has to be given for them. And then when we grow up, we are not individuals then either. The languages that we speak, we did not create. Um, the cultures and the foods that we are presented with and the, the architecture that we live in and all of these things have been given to us by, uh, by people other than ourselves. And so individuality, individualism is in many ways a myth. Now, I want to I wanna balance that out, though, with another thing. That is to say, it's possible to go too far with that. OK, and that is what happens in, say, the Eastern religions, you know, in Buddhism and so on, uh, where there is this idea that, you know, we're all just part of like we have no real identity, that the self is a delusion that is going too far as well. Christianity, spe specifically true Orthodox Christianity, uh, does have an appreciation for the individual. And we are all unique and precious before God. You know, when we go to communion, uh, we say our names. And we are, there is a prayer that is said, you know, uh, the servant of God, uh, you know, Joseph or the servant of God, um, you know, Mary receives the precious body and blood of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ unto life eternal and the forgiveness of sins. Um, and, uh, you know, so our, the, our name, our very person is precious before God. All of our hairs are count, counted, but it, but there is a great appreciation in, in the Eastern Orthodox Church for at once both the preciousness and uniqueness of the individual and the recognition that individualism is a perversion of that and a breaking of that. And, and there has to, there's a perfect balance really between East and West uh, in the Orthodox Church on this issue. Um, okay, now um, I, I, I left off before uh, uh, talking about church history. Let me just uh, give you a couple of quotations that I have salvaged from that book that I began the whole thing with, Infant Baptism in the First Four Centuries. Here is a quotation from St. Irenaeus of Lyon, as we talked about uh, a month or so ago, um, writing in the mid to late second century. He says, Christ came to save all through means of himself. All, I say, who through him are born again unto God, infants and children, boys and youths and old men. In fact, um, uh, he uses the word uh, parvulos, which if you've studied any Latin, you'll know it's a, it's a wonderful word because it is the diminutive of the word small. <laughs> the word small uh, is parvus. And when you put ulus at the end of something, it means the small version of that word. But this is the small version of the word small. So we might even say tinsi tiny, okay? Infantes et parvulos. Um, uh, a small linguistic aside. Uh, likewise, we also read in St. Gregory the Theologian, in his 40th oration, De Baptismo, have you an infant child? Do not let sin get any opportunity, but let him be sanctified from his childhood, from his very tenderest age. Let him be consecrated by the Spirit. Fearest thou the seal on account of the weakness of nature? Oh, what a small-souled mother, and of how little faith. Why, Anna, that would be Hannah, even before Samuel was born, promised him to God, and after his birth, consecrated him at once, and brought him up in the priestly habit, not fearing anything in human nature, but trusting in God. 
Uh, so a beautiful rhetorical uh, passage, but the one which of course draws on scripture um, of the idea of, of handing over, committing uh, as it were to Christ, uh, the, uh, the child that has before it's even been born. There is, a, so far as I have read, really only one voice from the ancient church that dissents from this consensus patrum, this con consensus of the fathers. And that, of course, would be Tertullian, who basically always was the dissenting voice on everything. Uh, now, it is important to note, uh, well, let's just read what he says before I give my two, two cents about this. Tertullian says, so according to the circumstances and disposition and even age of each individual, the delay of baptism is preferable, principally, however, in the case of little children. So he is the one person who basically says the entire you know, tradition of the church, no, you really shouldn't do that because, um, and he, the reason why he gives is he, later on, he explains this, if you read this treatise, um, he says basically, oh, well, if you, if you, uh, what, what would happen if, you know, uh, the godparent has to take the vows, you know, at baptism for the child, and then, uh, and then the child grows up and becomes a, an apostate, leaves Christianity, or becomes a terrible, uh, sinful person, um, you know, then, then the person will have to give an answer for that, per, for, that, uh, for that person. Well, obviously, the church did not accept that line of reasoning, because uh, it, 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 literally, you don't see anyone else talking like that. So, and, and of course, uh, as with everything with Tertullian, it is important to remember that where did he wind up? He left the church. He embraced a heresy known as Montanism. And this is by far uh, not the only uh, time when he says something that's basically totally wrong, uh, when he says something that's totally at variance with what everybody else is saying. There's many such examples. Um, now, I'll just kind of end this passage right now, this kind of, because I know we have to get on to talking about the Eucharist as well in the early church. I'll just read what I've written here. It must be said, though, that the practice of infant baptism, though it was certainly common in the early church, it was not compulsory nor invariable. And this is a crucial point, because I know probably many of you are probably thinking, well, what about Constantine? He was baptized on his deathbed, and I've always read that that was actually not uncommon in the ancient church. Yes, but both of those statements would be true. In many cases, Christian parents may have shared an act upon the opinion that I just read you expressed here by Tertullian in the early in third century. And, uh, and they might have thought it was well to defer baptism, uh, the baptism of their children, with the exception of cases of grave illness, uh, till they were able to make answer in their own name to the, the interrogations of the baptismal rite. And if you've ever read, which I'm sure many of you have, the Confessions of St. Augustine, you'll know that this is a very uh, this is exactly what happened with St. Augustine, his mother, St. Monica, uh, a believer. She could have baptized him as a child, but did not. Um, and, um, and he wasn't baptized until he was about 30. Um, interestingly enough, though, St. Augustine, even though he did follow that pattern, so parents could do that, indeed did do that sometimes. Nevertheless, it was actually a Augustine's influence direction that had a great influence in subsequent uh, develop, subsequent years uh, moving towards the abandonment of the practice of of putting of delaying baptism of deferring baptism until later in life um, and this and to the point where by the time you got to the fifth and sixth centuries it almost totally evaporated it just it just didn't happen at all infant baptism was a universal practice by that point so um and, and if you read some of St. Augustine's works on baptism and, and, some, and elsewhere where he talks about the issue, one of the points he really makes in it is goes, no, it would be wrong to, you know, a lot of people wanted to put off baptism because, well, I'm just going to sin a lot anyway, you know, might as well just, you know, save it all until I just before I die and kind of, you know, uh, go, go straight to heaven. Um, but St. Augustine's point is, no, that is not the Christian approach to life. You're missing out on the true life. Sin is not uh, the good life. Okay, the good life for man is to live close to Christ. And yes, that involves struggle. And yes, struggle involves the potential of sinning. Uh, you know, and, and indeed, it involves the, I would say, the, the foregone conclusion that we're going to sin on a lot of occasions. Um, St. Augustine has a very, very uh, realistic a, a, um, 
uh, estimation of human frailty. You know, he's very, very pessimistic about uh, obtainment of virtue. In fact, he'll, he'll even say, uh, in, not in so many words, but he, he comes to the conclusion on many occasions that virtue in this life, or, you know, or maybe put it like this, righteousness in this life consists far less in the attainment of virtue than it does in the remission of sins, okay? To go to confession frequently, to try not to sin, to fast, and to pray, to say your prayers, to be loving to people, and to receive the holy sacraments, this is, uh, this is enough, okay? This is, what, this is the best we can do to a large degree. Our own sinfulness is so monstrous in so many ways, I and mean, when it comes down to things that uh, it's very hard for most of us to ever attain to holiness. Uh, we can, but, but even to, to begin the journey, is enough um and uh you know to kind of have your to have the disposition of your heart be loving towards god uh you know we do trust in him ultimately for our salvation and uh you know getting back to what we talked about uh, before the class began tonight okay we can talk i, I will be happy to take questions about this because i realize this is a very important issue but i'd like now to turn on to um uh uh to the next issue, which is the Holy Eucharist. Uh, as I said before, the early church uh, in, its, in the first century, up until the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, was still uh, very Jewish in character in so many ways. But yet, they, although they did still worship in the temple, they would perform the mysteries of Christ in their private homes, and uh, the Eucharist was the central one among them. Now, the first thing to say about, about this, because of, of course, this is really another of the two of the major sticking points between Protestantism and Holy Orthodoxy. And um, that is the nature of the Eucharist. Is it just a symbol? Is it just something that, that uh, one does in kind of an intellectual remembrance of the Lord's uh, death and resurrection? Or is it actually the real presence of uh, we partake and we take into our very bodies ourselves. Um, let us begin by looking at the scriptures and what they say. We read in John 6, 48 through 58, I am the, that bread of life. You, you, this is, of course, Christ speaking to the Jews. And he says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now, if you go on and you read the gospel after this passage, you will find that the Jews who we, whom he is talking to all say, this is a hard saying. Who can say this? And they all turn away and abandon him. And even the disciples themselves are on the verge of doing the same thing. And Christ turns at them and Instead, you would expect, if he were speaking symbolically, <clears throat> he would simply say, oh, wait a second, guys, you've got it all wrong. I was just speaking symbolically. Uh, but no, what does he say? He says to Peter and to the rest of the disciples, do you want to go away too? And then at which point St. Peter says, uh, Lord, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. So there, there's every scriptural basis for the Eucharist right here. That we have in front of you. And I've always found it to be the most amazing thing. Um, you know, that uh, as I've told you before, I, I've, I take my family, I have taken them on, a, on more than one occasion down to Kentucky uh, to the 
uh, creation uh, museum down there and the ark uh, and uh, you know Ken Ham's thing answers in Genesis and I really really like it down there and uh, you know I, I feel in many ways uh, uh, like uh, I'm surrounded by really like-minded people in, in so many ways I you know they're very friendly very nice very Christian and I go uh, whenever I've gone I've gone dressed as a, as a deacon too I wear my cassock and 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 with with one exception uh one woman who was like the guest like worked behind the counter for like the gift shop uh everybody was like super super friendly and respectful of me um and you know even people coming up to me and, and telling me stories of their own testimony of of how Christ performed miracles in their lives and and uh, really wonderful people okay but I've I, I can't help but feel there's a certain tension there there is a certain dissonance there in the fact that the whole premise of the ocean which you know is such a huge undertaking and the answers in genesis the creation museum uh which is nearby you, you cannot help but feel there's a certain dissonance there where the people the very people who make it have made and put in such a great effort because they firmly believe that you must believe that every verse of this of scripture must be taken literally true uh right that it, it is it has to be six days of creation and on the seventh the lord rested six 24-hour days and yet when you get to john 6 58 whosoever um uh eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life eternal and i will raise him up at the last day and um uh and and john uh, and john 6 53 uh verily i verily i say unto you except ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you when they get to those verses which are by far much more important than uh than how long the creation took uh then they say oh that's just symbolic you don't have to take that literally literally okay there's a tremendous tension there a tremendous dissonance that um uh you know it's it's a, it's it's not consistent okay it is not consistent and as every uh, person who who has seriously thought about uh, the Lord has thought about truth in general and logic. You you we all know that truth must be consistent. Okay, you know you can't um, you can't say I believe in my body my choice for abortion and then say but I don't believe in my body my choice for vaccine mandates. You know uh, that is uh, that is an inconsistent position. Just I only use uh, a little video clip of somebody interviewing pro-life, uh, pro-choice uh, activists, and they all were both. They were pro-choice for the mandates, and uh, I'm sorry, pro-choice for abortion, uh, but not pro-choice for the mandates. And so I just use that as an example because that is a very clear indication of an inconsistent position. And we all feel, even the time when we're little children, that that is there's something wrong with that. Okay, truth must be consistent. So I don't know. I leave that for you to think about. Um, let us take a look at another scriptural locus, uh, which is also very important for our understanding of the scriptural basis for believing in the real presence of the Eucharist. And that is in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 32. Now, two things to point out here. First of all, this is one of the oldest pieces of writing in the New Testament. The epistles of St. Paul predate the Gospels themselves, especially the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John was written sometime in the early 90s uh, AD. Uh, whereas the epistles of St. Paul uh, come from the 50s, okay? Um, and the First Corinthians is, even if you're a uh, uber-liberal New Testament scholar from Fordham University or something like that, even they would accept First Corinthians as being a genuine Pauline epistle from, uh, you know, from the 50s, okay? So um, let's read it together. And look, okay, the second point, I said there were two points. The second point is the very first words, I have received of the Lord. Okay, now what does that mean? That's St. Paul's way of saying that I was taught this by the other apostles. Okay, um, that this tradition of performing the Eucharist inside of somebody's house, inside of these house churches, uh, which all scholars of liturgy all say that there is, uh, agree, are, in a, are in agreement upon, uh, in saying that the early church was not low church. It was not just people sitting around in a Bible study, maybe with an acoustic guitar or something like that. Um, it, the early church, archaeologists have found them. There's an early church in Dura Europis. There are early churches in Asia Minor. Um, and they have altars. Uh, they, uh, they clearly are, uh, you know, they, the sacrifices were performed there. That is, the Eucharistic sacrifice was performed there. Um, the, the catacombs, there are, there are um, altars there. All of the early, uh, all scholars of early liturgy 
all are in agreement with the fact that the earliest church of the apostles was not low church, but was uh, involved um, you, uh, liturgy. Okay, it involved set prayers and the performance of the Eucharist. Okay, so uh, so I have received of the Lord, that is, I was taught this by the other apostles, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, this of course is Holy Thursday, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, I want to show you the next phrase here. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What does it mean to examine himself? It means going to confession. Okay. And the proof of this is found in the Didache, which I know you studied before me, which clearly says in one of its chapters, confess your sins before you go to your, so, so that your sacrifice not be polluted confess your sins so that your sacrifice may not be polluted that's just another way of saying exactly what saint paul is saying of course the sacrifice itself would not be polluted it would be the person himself who is polluted who is partaking of damnation uh drinking damnation to himself eating and drinking damnation to himself because he does not discern the body and blood of the lord okay now he go and then he goes on and explains what exactly he means by this for this cause, namely that because many of you are not confessing your sins before you partake of Holy Communion, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And of course, by sleep, he means are dead. People have died because they have partaken of Holy Communion in a state where, in which they were uh, guilty of very, very profound sins and were not in a repentant state. Okay. Um, but if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Now, just to make the obvious point, you don't get weak and sickly and die because of crackers and apple juice or grape juice. Uh, the the idea that it's just a symbol, that it's just a you know ordinary kind of uh, bread and uh, and and wine or grape juice, uh, and and uh, that is a, that is totally not what we see here in scripture okay the power of the eucharist the, mis the mystery of christ saint paul uses that phrase elsewhere in the first corinthians he says we apostles are guardians of ta mysteria to christu okay the mysteries of christ um and the Orthodox Church, uh, in, you know, word mystery over against the term sacrament but sacrament is simply the latin word for it it's, both are perfectly fine but um the, uh, the but the phrase itself sacrament is not in the in the New Testament uh, because it is a Latin word. Um, mystery is what is found in the New Testament. Okay, and that captures really uh, something of, of what can be captured in the uh, in the tremendous reverence that we have to show for the mysteries of Christ. Okay, so um, with that, my friends, I realize we're getting close to seven thirty, and it's kind of maybe a good time to stop and to put a bookmark in it. Obviously, there's much more that could be said. But I would be happy to hear any or and to respond to any questions uh, that anybody has. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Father. Uh, we. I have just a, a few comments. I think uh, it is very important to cover this uh, two topics, even though there's plenty to say about all of this. Uh, I would just uh, come back to towards the end of your talk when you were talking about the uh, the, the hypostasis and atomos, the the difference between I would just to clarify that the difference between individual and a person. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to talk about just the etymology of the word and what the which is which are the words that the fathers use to differentiate between individualism and uh, personalism or, or persons. Uh, for example, in, in the Greek language, even today, when we want to refer to someone uh, as a number, 
uh, as part of a flock or a part of a group and so forth, we use the word atomos, atom, poso atomi iste, for example, how many people you are, how many uh, individuals or how many uh, uh, singular uh, uh, people you are. But when we talk about a person, we use the word hypostasis, and, and that's the word that the fathers use when they describe the person of Christ. And what is the difference between the individualism is, is, a, is a modern uh, uh, modern philosophical kind of uh, movement that has created the world we live today. The secularism uh, and everything that exists today is in rooted in individualism. The difference between individual and a person, and we, the Orthodox, we mainly use the word persons, we don't use the word individual that much, is because individual is someone who can be self-sufficient, someone who is enough of himself, he can be dependent only on himself, and he has interests of living in communion, in kinonia with the others, as long as they support his existence. Uh, so basically, it's a Luciferian theology, which uh, the main uh, principle of Luciferianism is the self-preservation. I am uh, enough of myself. I am <clears throat> satisfied with myself and my existence, as long as living with you, as long as you uh, live according to fulfill my interests, my, my existence. On the other hand, hypostasis or a person in the Orthodox Church is understood as someone who cannot live without the need of the other. Since one of Mount Athos, he says, my brother slash my sister is my salvation. Basically, there is no salvation with the others. And I like the analogy you brought with the nature because everywhere we see in the nature, whether it's the birds or the, the animals or the, the when we see the, the ants, the, the insects, they all live in community. They, they all live in, 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 uh, in Kinonia. And even us, Christ is uh, teaching us that the, the greatest two commandments are the first one is to love God with everything we have. And the second one equal to the first one is to love uh, our neighbor as oneself. Uh, and, and he says there is no greater sacrifice than to sacrifice your own life for your brother, for, your, uh, for the ones who are next to you. So that's a very important difference because the life that we live today, individualism is it's pushing us even more and more into alienation. And I remember, probably have heard, in our language we call process by Franz Kafka. Uh, he's an existentialist. I don't know how you call in English that translation of his book, uh, but he, he's... The metamorphosis? When, when he wakes up as a big bug? No, no, no. Uh, Franz Kafka, when he's uh, a process, when he... Basically, it's a very uh, long uh, novel when he describes this person who goes to this bureaucratic nonsense of finally to end up uh, being killed by, by the, by the oh, system. In, in English, we call it the penal colony. That's the name oh, of that. Oh, the penal colony. Okay, okay. I didn't know that. We call it the process. That, that, that's the, the translation we get. But anyway. I know that part. But that's, that's basically existentialists in, the time, in his time and before that, they, they, were, they were expanding on individualism that leads to death. Uh, St. Justin Popovich, he talks about uh, individualism as the greatest danger uh, and, and uh, basically completely uh, an, uh, alien to, to uh, the, the human nature. The Orthodox Church never uh, sees any person as an individual, but sees him only as a person. Uh, and, and I think that's very important to, to stress out, especially when we talk about, uh, uh, talk about the mystery of salvation. If we try to identify ourselves with Christ, who is a person above all, he has two natures, he has two wills, he has two energies, divine and human, but he is hypostasis, he is a person of Jesus Christ, of one, uh, of one unity of all of them. So uh, that, that, that's something that I just wanted to emphasize a little bit more, just to, uh, to put it in a, in a perspective. Uh, however, uh, uh, it's, I'm also thankful to you that you tried to uh, uh, you tried to explain about the Holy Communion and that, that the word sacrament, even though you can't find in the Latin Bugata or the, in the translation the Mysterium, it's a very present, many many times repeated word uh, when it comes to we just in English because we're, it's a Latin language we use the most. We, we translate it in sacraments. Holy, uh, the, the body and blood of Christ, we can be more, uh, can be more obvious that uh, the church never thought that the, the, the bread and the wine that we use and the water that we put in, in the wine is just a, a bread and wine, but it's a body and blood of Christ. It was always like that. And that's something that even when we get ordained as priests or deacons, we, we kind of give the, our oath that we're going to preserve this 
um, mystery undefiled. Uh, someone, uh, Nick, I think he has a question about uh, Judas. Uh, go ahead, Nick, just uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, so I heard um, a story about Judas. Uh, I think it was from St. Paisios where God lowers the tree and Judas is allowed to touch the ground while he's hanging himself. He, God actually bends the tree so Judas is able to touch the ground. And because he was giving him an opportunity to repent even after he betrayed Christ and he did not, he took a knife, I guess he had with him and he cut his stomach and all his entrails came out. Now you said he fell. I'm obviously thinking that did the rope break? I guess he lost balance and fell over to the side and the rope broke or I, I'm Let's just to, formalities. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. It's an important point because <clears throat> this is the sort of thing that, um, you know, people can, uh, you know, like they might cast in our teeth and say that, uh, you know, oh, there's, there's contradictions in the new Testament. I've got it in front of me. So, uh, in acts one eighteen through 19, it says Judas purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. Mm. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem inasmuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama, that is to say the field of blood. So, so does, it does yeah. say fall in the, in the scriptures. You know? Well, it does say too, his bowels, all his bowels came out too. So does that he mean doesn't. he cut himself, or does that mean he, when he hit a rock, it, you know, like? I think, I think the latter. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to um, contradict anything Saint Paisio said, but I, I don't, I've never heard that before in my life. I did hear there is something. Sometimes people have ideas, you know. There, Father, of course, please, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I know I, I one time read in Blessed Theophylact. Uh, I don't know if you ever have read his commentaries, Nick, um, but he, he wrote commentaries on all the Gospels. And he was writing in like the 12th century or something, I think BC, AD. And um, he said that Judas committed suicide knowing that he could go to hell and Christ would be there and he would able to be able to be saved. But the rope broke and it was only many years later that he actually died by going falling head forward and, uh, and in headlong and, and bursting in the midst. So different different I, I, i've never heard anyone else say that either and i don't that doesn't sound actually correct to me uh so I, I i don't i don't abide by that you know we it is possible that these later writers even holy saints had ideas that are not necessarily true you know um saint Irenaeus famously says uh, christ lived into his 50s you know that's just not right i don't know where he got that from you know <laughs> Uh, I was. Uh, I would just add that uh, what I think what Saint Paisius was referring to that when Judah was dying, he was experiencing uh, excruciating pain. Uh, his he didn't die right away, and that uh, while he was uh, when he hanged himself, he didn't immediately die like a like a like a mom, uh, momentous that that he stayed in that state for a little bit while, and it was uh, very painful for him. But those are uh, those are maybe kind of a local stories that uh, that you know the people were talking to about, and Saint Paisius was maybe taking out something from the traditions that he heard as well, uh, especially because he visited uh, Jerusalem and he lived for uh, uh, enough time in in, uh, uh, in Sinai as a monk. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would uh, just. We wanted to come, uh, Father, maybe that will be maybe an idea for the next, maybe sometimes to talk about individualism. I would like to come back again to that because, okay. you know, uh, what comes to me is, uh, again, when we talked about the individualism uh, and atomization of the humankind, you know, bringing everyone to become an individual. Yes. Uh, on, a, on a very deep subconscious level, uh, it transfers to us that the culture is being individualized to a point that you referred already, you know, changing your gender, doing this, everything is relative, everything is uh, per solipsism, it, the whole world revolves around me because my existence, very arrogant, very Luciferian perspective of things, but at the same time, it leads us to a self-destruction because that atomization or individualization of, of our culture can bring us even closer to the things that we now slowly see uh, happening in front of our eyes. I don't know, giving us chips and, and uh, making cyborgs, 
your uh, individual freedoms are, are illusion. There is no such thing as a free will. So we all need to kind of fold into this flock. Th those are the ideas of this guy, I think uh, Harari. What was his yeah, name? Oh, he was, oh, yeah, yeah. He, he, horrible. <laughs> we, he, he deserves to. Some, the, the, the strange and the, the, the very sad thing is that he's being uh, respected by so many uh, people uh, uh, from the, let's say, uh, some political uh, positions. And it's very kind of sad to see that, that uh, basically what, what he preaches is typical atomization of, of the humankind or individualization. Really. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, see, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask, or, or we can maybe wrap it up here because it's 730 uh but god willing yeah, we're coming on. yeah you wanted to say uh, something nick i'm sorry yeah yeah, yeah I, i'm really interested in the, well you said the hindus don't even look at themselves father deacon matthew and then i'd like to know where the meet the happy medium is with an orthodox christian because christ did die for us yeah. so it is about us but then as we're praying and we're seeking Christ, it becomes about him. So we're becoming more like Christ in that sense. Correct. Am I? Oh, absolutely. I would say it's, it's, it's like this. I heard a really nice analogy once that makes perfect sense to me, uh, that God is like the hub of a wheel. And all of us are like spokes coming off of that hub. And the further you go away from God, the further you are away from everybody else too, you see? And the closer you get to God, the closer you get to everybody else at the same time. And um, and this is so true, you know. Like, uh, I mean, I I I, uh, I you know when I was there last Saturday to see, uh, you know, for, to see you guys, you know, it was uh, here. Here is my family, you know, these the wonderful people who, uh, you know, who uh, perhaps we didn't know each other a year ago, but God has brought us together. And uh, you know what I mean? Uh, it's it, it's because we have a at least the desire the attempt to try to get closer to god that he can make us closer to one another and and of course probably all of us on some level can recognize that the further you know those times in our life when we've been far away from god uh you never feel more lonely than that you know the uh you know the the, the wasteland of sin you know where just everybody is a stranger to you um this this is uh, this is a very tragic thing but that's basically what the modern age is it's alienation that's really the word if i were to sum up modernism in a single word that's what it would be you know i would uh nick i would just add to to your point is that you know what father was referring to is that you have from the left side you have this complete uh individualization of the society but also on the right side you have these uh uh, pantheism that exists in the Eastern cultures, like Hinduism and what that everything is one, everything is uh, 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 created in a way that uh, when we die, we dissolve in this ex nihilo or, or nothingness that becomes the one, that God is basically everything that we see or in all that we see. That's, that's a very old heresy that uh, the church used to uh, tackle that with some uh, Gnostics who were teaching stuff like that. But uh, the balance that the Orthodox Church has is in the fact that, for example, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to communion, we, at the same time, we practice the private prayer, we call it the private prayer rule, but we don't meditate, we don't get stuck into this uh, constant questioning of our existence, rather we have a dialogue with God. Why? Because God is a person, and as much as we are free and have free will, he also has free whether to help us or not to help us, depending on uh, what, what we ask. So when it comes to that uh, the, the mystical uh, theology, if you want to call it, from, from the East, which is not the Orthodox, but rather the heterodox, it comes from, the, from India and from China and whatnot. It's more about pantheism. It's worshiping basically everything. So that's why they have like, I don't know, two million gods or whatever. Everything and anything can become a god as long as it's uh, being uh, uh, venerated like that or worshipped like that. Uh, it's a completely issue, but that's something that Father uh, Seraphim Rose talks about. That he himself was a Buddhist uh, at one point before he converted to Orthodoxy, and he has a very nice uh, explanation. Justin Popovich talks about that as well. That maybe one day we can talk about that to explain the difference. The Orthodox Church is 
the Orthodox theology always stays in the middle, following the royal difficult path uh, to walk upon, but it's uh, not left, not looking right, but rather staying on the course fo focused on Christ only and never lose our sight of him. That's what kept the, kept the Orthodox Church uh, uh, undefiled in, in all these years, even though it was persecuted from outside and from within, uh, even from their own, from, from uh, Orthodox emperors, Orthodox patriarchs who became heretics and whatnot. So I, I, I hope that makes any sense, Nicholas, uh, what we, we talked here. Yeah, that, that helps. That's how well, I understand. Thank yeah. Yeah, thank you. That helps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Father, uh, here maybe we can uh, finish it up because it's 7.35. But I uh, want to thank you again for being here. Hopefully next thank week you, we, can, we can talk again. Uh, in the meantime, let's say the prayers and we can finish with it. We'll publish this on our YouTube page, YouTube okay. uh, channel, so everybody can see it. Absolutely. Father, maybe you can give the blessing. Okay. Most blessed art thou, O Christ our God, who has, been, who has shown forth the fishermen as supremely wise by sending down upon them the Holy Spirit, and through them has drawn the whole world into thy net. O lover of mankind, glory be to thee. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, O Lord, bless. To the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy and save us. Amen. Amen.